in the last lot of videos we looked at evolution and the science of evolution and how that affects us and how we came to be here as evolved creatures so what we're going to do in this uh, set of videos now is look at the bible and what the bible says about creation and how that interacts with the study of evolution so what about the bible so let's begin with saying what we must do is look at what the bible really says not what we think it says or what we want it to say so really from a my perspective i suppose the bible is data and with data you've got to look to see what it really says not what we think it says or what we want it to say that's key when we're looking at the bible is to put aside all our preconceptions all the other things that we've been told and to look at what it really says not what we think it says or what we wanted to say so some questions about the bible well here we go so why are there no mobile phones in the bible why are there no cars in the bible why are there no democratic governments in the bible why is the bible not written in english and why is there no science in the bible well, the answer to all those questions is that in the culture, the biblical culture, none of those things had been invented yet. Yes, they did have democratic governments in Greece, but they certainly didn't have them in Israel, or in Babylon, or in Egypt. None of those things mentioned there were invented when the Bible was written. So what we have to do is put things into context. We have to move away from our understanding of the world and put things in the context of which they were written at the time. So today we have mobile phones, and that's a piece of technology which has changed the way we think about the world. At the moment we're living through a revolution in how we think about the world, driven by these new information technologies. Back in biblical times, the height of technology was bronze weapons. So technology influences not just how we live, but how we think, how we think about the world. And we're thinking about a time where the height of technology was a bronze axe, really. We live in a literal world where things are understood literally. This comes from the Enlightenment and our understanding of science and various other things. And it's made us look at the world in a very literal sense. But in biblical times, they lived in a much more symbolic world. This is a Canaanite god, Baal. People who worshipped Baal didn't really worship the brick, which had a picture of Baal on it. They were worshipping the symbol behind that. That's the thing. It's a much more symbolic universe than what we live in at the moment. So different cultures understand ideas differently. And what we have to do if we're trying to understand the Bible properly, we have to put ourselves in the shoes of the people who first wrote it as best we can. That's a very difficult thing to do, but we have to try and get into their culture. So here we go. Twelfth night. Now I'm... We did this a bit when we studied Shakespeare in school, didn't we? We all sat down, we had to listen to Shakespeare plays and what have you and all that sort of thing. And if you study Twelfth Night, there's a lovely line in that where one of the characters says, Whisper into my pregnant year. And that caused great hilarity in my class because we all thought it was stupid. Because how can someone's year be pregnant? And we all said to the teacher, That is stupid. This play is stupid. Why do we have to study this? What a load of rubbish. My pregnant you, stupid. But then what the teacher said to us was, he doesn't mean pregnant in the sense of having a baby. He means pregnant in the sense of waiting with expectation. So the word pregnant had changed in the 500 years or so since Shakespeare wrote this play into meaning something completely different. And because we couldn't be bothered to put ourselves into that Shakespearean universe, to understand the wonders of Shakespeare because we were 14. 
we just dismissed it as just stupid. Similarly, this is a picture of a, a wonderful uh, animated film called Spirited Away. And they're great, these uh, Studio Ghibli films, brilliant things. But they're very difficult to understand, even though they've been translated into English, because they're Japanese and they reference loads of parts of Japanese culture which we're unaware of because we haven't been brought up in Japanese culture. And the temptation again is to sort of dismiss it and say, this is ridiculous, I can't understand this. But if, if we spend a little bit of time learning about Japanese culture, the whole experience of watching this film becomes much, much better. So we have to understand the culture behind what is written in order to deeply appreciate what these people are trying to say. So the temptation is always to be a bit like uh, this guy here, Clarkson, and say, your culture is stupid and backward, and I'm really, really, really clever. To be like I was and the rest of our class were when I was 14, and dismiss Shakespeare as stupid. But maybe a Bronze Age person would say back to uh, Clarkson, yeah, but at least I won't go down in history as the generation that destroyed the climate of the whole world. And maybe it's worth reflecting for a moment what future generations will say about our culture and uh, what we get up to. So why do we have this temptation to dismiss things and to put onto other cultures our own understanding and not taking the time to deeply analyse what these people are trying to say? Why do we dismiss people? Why, why, are, why is that little bit of Jeremy Clarkson in all of us? Well, part of our culture and our cultural development is this. There's this idea within Western culture of we are the civilised people and we are civilising the world. The Romans had it, the Greeks had it, all the same problem. This idea of civilising the world by spreading our culture of civilization and seeing other cultures as barbaric and pointless and we have to be always be careful when we think about other cultures and other peoples because there's this idea is within us as part of Western European culture and North American culture. It's something that's there and we have to be aware of it. So what we have to do really is imagine for a moment that we found this text I'm going to show you in a minute in 3000 years time. And how would we know what type of literature it was? So here we go. So if I read of this now, it says, Do you ever feel like a plastic bag drifting through the wind, wanting to start again? Do you ever feel so paper thin like a house of cards, one blowing from caving in? And it goes on to say at the end, Because baby, you're a firework. Come on, let them show what you're worth. Make them go, oh, oh, oh. And shoot across the sky aye, aye. now if we understood that literally we think that's ridiculous people can't be fireworks that's absurd why why would anybody want to be a firework people would blow up that's ridiculous so imagine you found that in 3000 years time without looking into the culture of when this was made who wrote it why it was written and what other types of literature were written in the same way, looking at how the literature is written and the style of the literature. And anyone who knows much about pop music will know it's uh, Katy Perry's Fireworks song. So we know today that Katy Perry released this record because it's on the radio all the time and all the rest of it. So we know that now, but in 3,000 years, they won't know that, maybe. So what you have to do then, if you found this piece of literature, is compare it to all sorts of other types of literature made at the same time to find out what it was. Because if you didn't do that, you just took it literally, you'd think that 3,000 years ago people wanted to be fireworks and blow themselves up. So we do the same with the Bible. We look at what other types of literature were written in the Bible or in other things around that time and we compare them stylistically in other words the style of the writing in order to find out what type of literature it is so here we go this is the beginning of uh, one Genesis in the beginning God created the heavens and earth 
and the earth is a formless void, etc., etc. And there's the second verse. So here we go, and we can compare that to another type of literature which is similar. Now then, if we think back to Katy Perry's Firework song, we know it's a song because it's got a certain structure. It goes verse, chorus, verse, chorus, and it rhymes as well, because all songs in our culture rhyme. So you'd be able to say, this is a song because it's got a verse and it's got a chorus, it's got a verse and it's got a chorus, and all of it rhymes. Therefore, it is a song. Now then, we do the same with the Bible. Now they don't use rhyming in the Bible, they use something called parallelism, where we have the same chorus that it comes back to again and again and again and again. And you see this in the structure of the Psalms. So if we look to the right of the screen, you'll see Psalm 120, and you can see coloured in there red, it says, and they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them in, from their distress, and so on. Later on in the Psalm, it does the same thing. It says, they cried in the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. So it's the same refrain, but it's changed very, very slightly. That's what it is, this parallelism. Continually coming back to the same refrain, but changing it very slightly. In the Bible, there's loads and loads and loads of songs. It's full of songs. And if you say the daily office, uh, you'll sing them or say them every day. That's what monks have been doing and priests have been doing for thousands of years. Saying the Psalms and saying the other songs from the Bible in the same way. Now then, we know that uh, one Genesis is a song because it's got a chorus. And, he, then he, and then there was evening and then there was morning the first day. And then there was evening then there was morning the second day. And it goes on and on like that. So it's structured like a song. It's a hymn in the same way as a psalm is a hymn. We know that from the way it's written. And by comparing it to other songs from the Bible and other songs from that culture at the time. So why was Genesis 1 written? Well, it's written not for scientific reasons because science wasn't invented. It's written for theological reasons. It's written for people at the time to show how different Hebrew ideas of God are from the ones around them. Now, the picture you're looking at there is uh, a Babylonian God. And the Babylonians, who had a great influence on the Hebrews, because if you remember from the Bible, uh, the Hebrews spent a very long time, or quite a while, in um, exile in Babylon. So the Bible's greatly influenced by Babylonian culture and Egyptian culture as well. And basically, Babylonians said, along with many, many other cultures around that time, that the world was created, or the universe was created, through a battle of the gods. Greek culture is a similar idea as well, where there's a massive battle of the gods, and out of that battle comes creation. That's what their understanding is, is the world is created by a battle of the gods. Order because the good gods win, the good gods of order win the battle of the gods because they destroy the gods of chaos. That's a paraphrase of Babylonian myths and as well Greek myths of the creation of the universe. Okay, It's a battle of the gods where order wins over chaos. But the Hebrew god is radically different to the other gods which were around at the same time, which made the Hebrew people a kind of laughing stock really of the people around it the idea of there being one god was just ridiculous to many of the cultures around them so here's the egyptian gods there they are looks like something from marvel really doesn't it but there you go it's a picture of the egyptian gods all those different ones there's the picture of the babylonian gods all in procession and there's the Greek gods, which we're all a bit more familiar with. So lots and lots of gods, and the universe is created by a battle between the gods, and then the gods of order win. And as the gods of order win, they bring order to the universe, and we have a universe like we know now. But the Hebrew god is very different. The Hebrew god doesn't have a picture. There's nothing to represent him. 
all in are these words Yahweh, Elohim, etc. And if you went into the temple in Israel, it was ma radically different to all other temples because it didn't have an image of the God that they worshipped in there. So it's a radically different way of thinking. And what one Genesis is saying really, it's taking the myths of the creation of the universe where order defeats chaos and saying no it's not a battle of the gods that creation comes from at all. It's actually one God who creates all things. That's all it is. It's saying that there's one God who creates all things and it's a hymn to him. That is it. So it's not a scientific explanation because they couldn't have that because they didn't understand what science was because it hadn't been invented yet. It's a theological understanding of how the universe is created and saying that the creation of the universe for the Hebrew God is different to all the other gods around them. So what about the rest of Genesis? Well, first thing to say really is we think about the Bible or the book of Genesis as a book. And sometimes we think about it in the same way we think about other books around today. And the way we think about books is influenced really by the printing press. Again, technology affects the way we think about the world around us. But there wasn't a printing press around in the times of Genesis, and they didn't understand books as we do today. They had no concept of copyright or authorship or any of those sorts of things. It's radically different. The books of the Bible are basically a library which is stitched together across thousands of years. And even the book of Genesis really doesn't have a single author, it's got multiple authors and is put together as um, an anthology really of various different stories over hundreds and hundreds of years. So it's not one author, it's several. Really the closest thing we have to that today is something like a box set. It's various different films put together in a box set. So this one here is the Arnold Schwarzenegger connection. So lots of different types of literature. We've got comedies. Well, they're all comedies really, aren't they? Comedies, action films, and so on. But because they're all about Arnold Schwarzenegger, they're all in the same box set. Multiple different stories, multiple different films put together. And that's really what the book of Genesis is, what the Bible is. It's a box set all put together at a much later date. So here's a plan of the book of Genesis. Now as you said earlier, it's not a single book, it's actually lots and lots of different stories who are put together as an anthology. So a plan for it is something like this. So we have the opening hymn, which is Genesis chapter 1, and then we have the story of the fall, which is people think it's just one chapter but it's actually Genesis chapter 2 all the way through to Genesis chapter 11. There's a collection of stories there which are all about the fall of mankind. And then the last block really is the patriarchs which is the story of Abraham, the story of Isaac, the story of Jacob and the story of Joseph. So really what we have in the book of Genesis is lots and lots of different stories which are all put together in one book. Now before the printing press people would understand that, they'd understand that naturally um, books weren't exact copies of each other because there was no way of doing that really and they would understand that all these different stories were put together in anthology a bit like Hans Christian Andersen books or the Brothers Grimm or things like that where they're not one particular story, they're lots and lots of different stories put together in an anthology. But with the book of Genesis there's a theme that runs all the way through and most theologians or most Christian people understand this in this way of splitting it into these three groups. So I said that uh, the second block were myths so what are myths? Now today we understand myths as things which are basically false. A myth is something which is a falsehood. 
Now, I don't mean a myth in that sense, like all Mythbusters on Discovery Channel. That's not like that. Myths are, in this context, symbolic stories. So they're stories that tell us about who we are as human beings. That's what they are. And all cultures have myths that do this. So, here's Pandora. Pandora opens up her box in the story of Pandora's box. So, the story is, the world is entirely good and all the evil of the world is put into a box and a person says to Pandora, don't open the box, don't open the box, whatever you do, because all the evil is going to come out. But then Pandora gets all a bit curious and she opens it up and all the evil comes out, out of the box and then at the end hope comes out as well. So that's a story, a myth, which tells us about what it is to be a human being. Another example of this is uh, the example of Atlantis. Now, Plato, uh, in ancient Greece, wrote a book all about Atlantis, and he talked about Atlantis as the perfect society, a perfect society where everything was wonderful, but then Atlantis was destroyed. So it's a myth, it's a symbolic story that tells us about who we are as human beings. And finally, there's the story of Adam and Eve. And all of these stories are about the same thing, really. It's this idea of why is the world the way it is? What has gone wrong in our world? In a way, they're about looking back to a golden age where everything was wonderful and great. You know, like, like listening to uh, older people, or people who look back with rose-tinted glasses about how great it was in the 1950s, that sort of thing, is this idea that... In the past, the world was wonderful, but somehow things have gone wrong. And what it's really about really, is about coming of age. It's about understanding that the world is not perfect. Because when we're little kids, we think the world is okay. We think it's perfect because we don't understand the difference between right and wrong. But as we grow older, we understand two things. We understand that there's evil in the world, and we understand that we're going to die and we lose our innocence and that's what Adam and Eve's all about it's the idea of the loss of innocence and growing up it's about the story of every human being because Adam means man and Eve means woman and notice at the beginning it says they were naked but they felt no shame now anyone who's uh, got little kids, babies, toddlers that sort of thing will know that they have no concept of shame they don't they don't understand it they don't understand why they have to wear clothes we have to teach them that it's not good to run around with no clothes on that's part of being kids but as they grow older they become more aware of themselves and aware of all these different things and that's what the story of adam and eve is all about it's becoming aware of evil in the world and the loss of innocence and all the other stories afterwards, Cain and Abel, uh, Noah's Ark, all those, the Tower of Babel, it's all this story about sin, about the idea where evil has entered the world and the consequences of evil, our loss of innocence as human beings and our breakdown of our relationship with God. That's what they are. they myths not about a particular person, but about all human beings. And again, that would have been understood by people for thousands of years. But because we live in a different culture, that can be quite difficult to understand. And that's why nobody looked for Atlantis until the Victorian times, because everybody understood it was a myth. But now there's plenty of people on the internet, and plenty of people have had a go at trying to find Atlantis, but they never will, because it's a myth, because it's a symbolic story, and it's the same with Adam and Eve. The culture changed. So how do we know their myths? Well, there's the, the first thing is they're similar in their stylistic content as other myths that were around at the same time. We don't take Pandora's box literally. We don't take uh, Plato's Republic with uh, the story of Atlantis literally. So why, why should we take Adam and Eve literally? It's of the same style. It's the same stylistic understanding of the world. The next thing is we know their myths as well because they've got ridiculous ages in them and there's lots of things like this like Adam is 930 years old and 
Seth is 912. That's ridiculous. They've got ridiculous ages in them. And that tells us that they're not to be understood. Literally. That's basically what it means. It's a symbolic age. It's not a literal age. How do we know that then? Well, we can always say that they were just stupid. And they were so stupid in the ancient world that they believed this. They believed in the ancient world that Adam could be more than 900 years old because they were stupid. Now today, we're not stupid and backward. We're clever. Uh, we know they're not. Well, maybe. But what might be more likely is today we know how old we are because we've got a birth certificate. And knowing how old we are is very important because we have to get served in the pub when we're 18 and we've got to get a pension when we're 65 and so on and things like that. We live in a much more legalistic world like that where your age and being able to say how old you are and prove how old you are is very important. Back then, they didn't have birth certificates and more than that, they didn't have a dating system. Like I know I was born in 1977 but 3,000 years ago, what did they date the year off? And as you get older, you lose track of how old you are, don't you? You can quickly work it out, because you know when you were born. But if you don't know what year you were born in, as it didn't exist, you don't have a birth certificate, how on earth are you going to know? So ages weren't important to these people in the same way they were now. So they knew, for two reasons. One, because they knew it was impossible to be 900 and odd years old. And also as well, because it wasn't that important to them. These ages are there to show us that this is a prehistory. It's another time. It's something which is different to the time that we live in today, or the time that they were living in. That's why you have these funny ages. So all Genesis 1 tells us really is that God created the world, and he created the world not like the Babylonian gods did, or the Greek gods did, or the Egyptian gods did. It's an apologetic thing, really, of saying that, a song saying that the Hebrew god is different to the Babylonian god. That's what that says. And the Genesis 2 to 11 is all about the fall of humanity and the understanding of the world isn't the way it should be, really, which is something we've all experienced. So if we want to understand what the Bible says about creation, we have to look in different places because there's lots of other texts about creation in the Bible. And there's two on you which are the central ones really. One is Psalm 19 and the other one is John 1. Now Psalm 19 says, The heavens are telling us of the glory of God and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. One day pours forth his speech and night to night declares knowledge. Although they have no words or language and their voice is not heard, that their voice goes out from all the land and their words to the end of the world. Now, what the Psalms tell us about creation and other parts of the Old Testament is this idea of God bringing order out of chaos. And this comes as well in the ideas in Genesis 1 as well. This idea of order being good and chaos being evil. Order and chaos. And what Psalm 19 is saying is that the idea of order and structure is hardwired into our universe. As our universe is an orderly universe where things happen in an ordered fashion. That's what it's saying. And that points to the orderliness of God and the goodness of God because of the orderliness of creation. That's what the Psalms are saying. So we can understand that the law of God isn't just about, say, the Ten Commandments and so on and things like that is the law of God is actually the laws which govern our universe. So laws like gravity, laws like evolution, and so on. This idea that there is order in our universe. So order is good, chaos is bad. And the second one we're going to look at is from the New Testament. And in the New Testament it focuses much more on the person of Jesus. And this is the one we hear at uh, Christmas time. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things came into being through him. And without him, not one thing came into, be into being. And in John 1, what he's saying is that the word, who is Jesus, the word of God is Jesus Christ. 
So creation must tell us something about the person of Jesus Christ. So the ideas of the story of Christ is hardwired into creation itself. That's what John 1 is actually saying. So, what does create mean in the Bible? This I understand is English word create. What does it mean in a Hebrewic, uh, sorry, Hebraic um, context in the Bible? So God says, I created the universe. The Hebrew word create means to separate and bring order out of chaos. The word create in uh, Genesis 1 means this. It means to separate order from chaos. And if we read uh, the hymn, Genesis 1, that's what it's all about. It's about bringing order into a chaotic universe, separating different species into their different kinds, separating heaven from earth, bringing order to the chaotic, formless void of the universe. And that word, which is translated as create, means that. It means to separate things and to bring order to things. It doesn't mean to make. There's a different word for make, and that's translated as form, like a potter forming a pot out of clay. So the word used for create is different to the word for make. It's a totally different understanding of that word. So that's why I was saying earlier that we have to look at what the Bible really says, not what we think it says. So we think of creation as making things. That's not what Genesis 1 is talking about. That's not what the Psalms are talking about. It's all about this idea of separating order from chaos, bringing order into a chaotic world. So biblical creation. Order equals goodness, the order of the universe. Evil equals chaos. Now, in the Psalms, there's a, a Leviathan and there's monsters and things like that, and these monsters symbolize chaos. And in the New Testament, there's a, a dragon thing, the dragon, which represents chaos. So the idea of creation is about order goodness destroying chaos evil so God brings order to the universe by destroying the chaos of evil and God alone not the battle of the gods so creation is not an event that took place in the past it's actually a process and we understand this because we've all seen babies so babies are created they're not created in the past. Creation is an ongoing process that goes on and on and on through time. And creation only ends at the end of time where God says, Behold, I make all things anew. So creation is an ongoing process where chaos is continually being defeated by order. And that will only reach its full extent at the end of time because we still live in a chaotic and evil universe so order from chaos so remember this slide from before order from chaos so there we have our tree our river our leaf order all these things look so different. They seem totally chaotic, but they're not. They're ordered. These things only come into being because of the laws which underlie them. That law of positive feedback, that self-similarity law, the mathematics that underpin all of life. Order from chaos. Again, looking at our own lungs they look like trees etc this self-similarity order from chaos and we saw it with the spiral again didn't we where we looked at how this continual doubling that same equation that we looked at before gives rise to order from chaos the chaos of a hurricane when we zoom out 
is the orderliness of that same spiral. So all the way through creation, we always have this tension between chaos and order. Just like in Genesis 1 and in the Psalms, the heavens declare the glory of God. The laws which govern creation show the orderliness and the goodness of God. That's what a biblical understanding of creation is. Even though the world is chaotic, if we go out to that, we see that order of God. So what does, cre what does creation say about Jesus? Because as we remember from earlier, I said that in the New Testament, in John 1 and in Romans and various other places, it says that creation must say something about the person of Jesus Christ. The story of Jesus, according to the New Testament, is hardwired into our created order. So creation must say something about Jesus. So the central story of Jesus is that he died and then he is reborn in the resurrection. So death and resurrection is the central part of the story of Jesus. So that story must be hardwired into creation. So death and resurrection hardwired into our universe. So evolution itself, the laws of evolution, the laws that govern evolution are all about positive feedback through death and resurrection. Here we have the asteroid or the comet smashing the earth causing the extinction of the dinosaurs. Evolution can only occur through mass death and then rebirth. So the mass death of the dinosaurs and then the world dies but then the world is reborn into the world of the mammals. This process of positive feedback and death and resurrection is hardwired into the laws that govern evolution. So we see this again with the bug. The bug is killed by the antibiotics and then the bug is reborn as the superbug. Death and resurrection. The laws which govern evolution have to enable death and resurrection. That positive feedback. That's exactly how it happens. The same actually in the creation if we look at stars. Anything really. Everything in our universe is governed by this idea of death and resurrection. The molecules that make up our bodies are from the death of stars. A star dies and explodes in a supernova, which then makes up the elements that make up our very beings. And uh, Moby, a few years ago, brought up a song, We Are All Made of Stars, and that's what it's about. Our bodies ourselves are made up of the resurrected ashes of stars. Death and resurrection is hardwired into our universe. Death and resurrection is part of the law which drives forward evolution. Those laws we talked about of positive feedback are dependent on death and resurrection. So why is there a conflict? Why do people think there's a conflict between science and religion or science and faith? Well, in the past we have your John Calvin, a uh, theologian from the Reformation, and uh, St Augustine from the beginnings of Christianity. And they talked a little bit about this and they said there is no conflict. But something went wrong in the 17th century and there we have Mr Usher, Mr William Paley and the most annoying person in all of Christianity who wrote All Things Bright and Beautiful which I hate not just because it's got naff theology but because everybody has it all the time at their funerals and it's all their fault and in the next video we'll talk about where this perception of a conflict comes from, talk about the ideas of um, evidence and scientific evidence and talk a little bit more about these uh, laws which govern evolution and govern our universe. So I hope you've enjoyed this and uh, we'll tune in in uh, a few weeks time when I get round to doing 
my next video all about why there is this perception of a conflict between science and religion.